So, uh, one of my favorite things. So, um, I actually didn't start learning Python until about four years ago, maybe five, five years ago. And one of the things that attracted me most to Python that I was the most excited about was actually SciPy and NumPy. Um, because I do a lot of data munging, um, as you might imagine, a lot, of, a lot of big data and data processing and that sort of thing. And for years and years and years, I used a language called R for doing that. How many people have also used R? Yes, I got a fair, yeah. So, but I always had some problems with R. Um, one is it was really hard to debug. Um, and the second was an awful lot of the modules were maintained by academics who didn't really care if they crashed um, uh, during production. Um, and so SciPy allowed me to do a lot of the stuff that I had been doing with R um, in code that I could maintain a lot better. Um, plus the graphing library is, m the graphing library mefplotlib is much, much better. Um, so I was really excited about SciPy, but of course I am a PostgreSQL geek um, and I do stuff in PostgreSQL and all kinds of big multi-terabyte PostgreSQL databases and doing all kinds of stuff um, using PostgreSQL as my main tool um, because I know it'll store my data and that I won't lose any data and that I can do lots of stuff concurrently, um, I, you know, providing sort of a concurrency in uh, engine for that. Um, and also really cool stuff like, for example, GIS for geographic data, um, which we use all over um, the data munging industry. So I was thinking, It'd be really nice if I could take both of these tools that I love and put the two of them together um, and actually use them together in order to do some of the data analysis and data science that I, that I use. Now, aside from if you're not coming from uh, my background where, where you, you already have this predilection for uh, doing things in Postgres and that sort of thing, you might say, well, yeah, but how does that apply to me? Why should I care about, um, you know, using SciPy in Postgres and that sort of thing? And the biggest reason has to do with pipelines. Because if you are crunching a lot of data in SciPy in the sort of conventional way, where you're doing it in your own sort of memory space and that sort of thing, what happens is you send, SciPy sends a request to PostgreSQL, and then PostgreSQL sends this giant fat pipe of millions of rows of data back to SciPy. Um, and if you're doing a lot of sort of interesting things, like you're doing correlations and that sort of thing, or if you need to, um, you know, pull a bunch of other stuff, the, um, you can need to request your data in chunks. And when you're doing that across the network, this can actually take a lot of time. You can actually spend a lot of time sending data. And if you want to do correlations and stuff that might be larger than memory, then you can actually end up going back and forth across the network a whole bunch of times to fetch data from Postgres. And for a lot of these operations, you soon discover that you're actually spending more time shuttling data back and forth than you are doing, doing anything else, um, which gets pretty painful. So, um, so, for that sort of stuff, um, which is definitely the kind of stuff that I do, I started looking, how, how about if we keep the computations a lot closer to the data? Um, and that has some tremendous benefits because we already have some hooks within Postgres to do things like aggregation and calculations over windows and spill stuff to disk if it doesn't fit in memory um, and correlate data here with data there. Um, and use actually some of the Postgres tools in order to do the same stuff that we're doing with SciPy a lot faster. And the way that we do that um, is a something called a PL um, in, in Postgres Lingo. A PL stands for procedural language. Um, and uh, that comes from the term stored procedures. Um, so we've got these procedural languages, but when we first added PLs in Postgres back in 1999. Um, the first PL that we added was actually TCL because the person who was working on it really adored TCL. Does anybody here use TCL? I see we got some people. So it's still there, still works. 
still maintained. Um, but he added TCL, and in order to add TCL, he had to add this whole pluggable interface where you could actually support any language as a, a PL, as long as you could call it through a library, or we could come up with some way to call it through what looked like a library. Um, and so that included Lua and Ruby and Perl and JavaScript, um, Java via um, some framework, um, and of course, Python. As a matter of fact, among the Postgres procedural languages that people install um, as an option to Postgres, um, the Python is second only to our built-in um, SQL extension language called PLPGSQL. Um, it's very popular to actually use Python inside the database with Postgres. So now, this doesn't come built into core Postgres. Um, it comes uh, generally as a separate package. Like if you're on Debian or Ubuntu, you need to install Postgres PL Python 9.8. Um, if you're on, I don't know how you install it to be a homebrew. Um, I'm not a Mac guy, um, but it's going to be a separate install command. Um, and then the second thing that you actually have to do is install what's called an extension in Postgres world. Basically, all of the optional Postgres components, well, not all of them, but a lot of the optional Postgres components are installed as what are known as extensions, which are loadable objects that you can actually load into Postgres, kind of like an import statement. Actually, a lot like an import statement. Um, so, for example, if we actually look at this sample database that I've set up, we actually have three extensions loaded in here. Uh, one is loaded by default, which is the SQL extension language, which is only there so that you can remove it, um, since it is loaded by default. Second one is PLPython U, and the third one is PostGIS. Um, uh, now, people say, wait, PLPython U, where did this U come from? Well, I'd like to say it's Python for you, um, but unfortunately what that you represents is something that's actually kind of a pain in the butt. Um, so we have this concept in Postgres of trusted and untrusted languages, which is security language we use the wrong way. Um, the way that we mean it is a trusted language is one that has a safe container in its library where the library will guarantee that that language will not make calls out to the file system or to network sockets or other things that might allow a user to escalate privileges on the system. Um, so JavaScript is actually a good example of a trusted language because it was designed for browsers and for that reason it has a safe container. Unfortunately, there is no safe container for Python. So Python can only run as what's called an untrusted language, um, which means that you need super user access, you need special privileges in the database in order to install it and in order to make use of it. The main way that this becomes a pain in the butt for you is that if you're on Heroku or RDS, PL Python is not an option for that reason because they run your stuff on a special framework and they don't want you getting outside of that sandbox and for that reason they don't give you access to PL Python. If you're running it on your laptop, you don't care. You know, you're already in there as super user, just go ahead and use it. So, now, like I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of Postgres sort of primitives, and I'm actually going to show some but not all of them uh, that really help support um, using Postgres with, Sci with SciPy. Um, these are things that we actually feed into SciPy. So Postgres, for example, supports arrays of objects, um, arrays of, of scalars. And with the Python libraries, with PsychoPG and with PL Python, um, we can automatically transform Postgres arrays back and forth to Python lists, or more importantly, to the NumPy array-like um, uh, generic type. Um, the, um, so you can actually pull stuff as an array from Postgres and put it into um, a Python function and then send it back out as a list and have Postgres see it as an array, um, which is really nice. Um, the um, second thing is this concept of aggregates. You're familiar with this is like max and sum and that sort of thing but there's a lot more you can do with them in Postgres. Another one is this concept called windowing queries. Um, and the idea of a windowing query is, you wanna say something like, give me the total over the last 10 of these that you saw. Or for each one in this group, compare the total with the current value. Um, the, and this is really useful for a lot of data analysis. And I'll show you one example of that. Um, current versions of Postgres also support materialized views which can be a good way 
to update data that is coming from in from external sources. Um, and then, of course, PostGIS for geographic stuff. How many people doing geodata of some kind? Yeah, lots. So, um, to make this more fun, we actually need some demos. Um, so I decided I would do some open data stuff for this. Um, and so my little demo here is called Don't Park Your Bike There. Um, now, I actually wanted to do this using Portland data. Um, but for some reason, uh, Civic Apps pretty much stopped posting most data sets in 2010. Um, so like there's no bike information that's newer than that that I could find. Um, the, um, so I ended up using San Francisco data um, where I actually had up-to-date information on both bike parking and bike thefts, um, which is what I'm using. If any of you here are involved with city open data, ask them, what's up with that? <laughs> Why do we have no new data? Um, so, um, so I actually, um, I pulled down two data sets. Um, one is called bike parking, which has all of the actual bike racks in the city of San Francisco. Um, and the second one is crime data, which is just a stream of reported crime incidences from the SFPD for about the last uh, 20 months. Um, so, for example, oof, okay, getting some bad wrapping there. Um, When you look at bike parking, we have an address and a location name and that sort of thing, and what I'm interested in, which is the actual geographic location um, on a coordinate system um, with, with number of racks in placement. And for crime data, we have the incident and category and description and you know when it happened information, who's police district, what happened with it, et cetera. So um, the, so, the first thing that I actually want to see with this is I actually want to compare some of this data because, right, you know, I could map out where, you know, our sort of bike parking is and that sort of thing. But what I'm really interested in is which bike racks are bikes getting stolen from? Because whichever ones those are, I don't want to park my bike there, right? So now I have to get a little loose about this because the location system used by the people who map the bike wraps is not the same as the location system used by the SFPD. And the SFPD tends to pin everything to the midpoint of the block wherever it was report, the crime was reported. So I can't do an exact correspondence to say, okay, these bikes were stolen from these bike racks. So I actually have to do, let's look at every bike theft that occurred within 25 meters of a bike rack location. Um, I, I tried, actually, when I was setting this up, I tried different sizes and 25 meters, tended to get what was near the bike rack without getting a lot of extra stuff. Um, the, um, so let's actually take a look at what that looks like. Hold on, I have to scroll through my buffer. And that's it. So here we've got this. So far, we're not using any SciPy for this. Um, this is just post-GIS stuff um, with Postgres, and we just say, uh, but I'm getting the data that I'm going to feed to SciPy, and I'm going to say, hey, I want to get a location name address um, and a count of the number of thefts from bike parking. And I'm adjoining it against the crime data by using a circle. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I ended up with 50 meters. A circle 50 meters around the location of the bike rack. Um, and we can actually see some stuff there. Um, and we've already got um, some patterns here um, in terms of, hey, 66 bike thefts at the Westfield Center. That's pretty high. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of this stuff near 865 Market Street seems to be a bad place to park your bike from a total number of thefts perspective. But... One of the things that I actually really, really hate when I see people doing stuff like crime stats is they look at, oh, you know, this and such, like car break-ins, bike thefts are up 20% this year in this particular location. And they actually drill down to the data, and 20% means that last year there was four, and this year there was five. 
And from an analyst perspective, what that's lacking is what's called significance. That is a variation between four and five in an individual year, you know, is, is one guy's, you know, one bike. Um, it's not significant. So we need to actually figure out whether or not the variations between locations are significant statistically. And there's a number of statistics tests that ship in SciPy um, to help you determine signif significance. Um, your simplest one is um, for a group of things is going to be a chi-square test, right? So we'll look at chi-square test, and chi-square will tell us, hey, for this population of things, what's the probability that these are just random variations on a uniform distribution or not? Um, the, um, and we can go ahead and plug that into Postgres. So we've got the PL function here, and we're going to take an, a Postgres array, which will get turned into um, a NumPy array. Uh, we'll actually get turned into a Python list, which will get turned into a NumPy array. Um, the, um, and then we're just going to use the stats module to just run a simple chi-square um, with assuming a uniform distribution, um, which is the default for the chi-square module. Um, and then we're going to return the p-value um, uh, to get an idea of the probability of this being a random distribution. Now, PL, the PL functions that I actually use for the stuff I get paid for tend to be a lot more complicated than that. Um, this is a portion of the code from the one that inspired me to actually write this talk in the first place. Um, this is actually attempting to determine groupings for the most common pointings for power generating wind turbines. Um, I, based on having 360 degree coordinate system data coming in from the wind turbines on a continuous basis. There's a whole bunch of code that goes in for error correction, um, which, which was needed for these. Uh, but the biggest thing was to actually use uh, the NumPy tools in order to come up with a way to figure out what's a reasonable way to group pointings on a 360 degree circle system. Um, uh, the, um, so after we've created this chi-square function, the thing is we don't want to run it for like one value, right? And we don't want to hand type in the values. What we want to do is we want to take an entire column of data in Postgres and turn that column of data and run the chi-square over the, the R sample here, right? So now Postgres makes that pretty easy because well, we have built-in aggregate functions in Postgres like max and sum and count, all of those are just C functions that have been plugged into our aggregate system. And you can actually write a function in any language and plug it into the aggregate system in order to create your own custom aggregate, which can then be run over a column of data. Um, and the language to do that is extremely cryptic, but it is fairly brief. Um, so what you do is that you create an aggregate and you tell it what data type or data types. We support multi-factor aggregates if you need them for some reason. Um, there are a number of useful ones in statistics land. Um, and then you tell it how to process the data. So there's an initial condition which tells you how to set it up. In this case, a Postgres empty array. That cryptic set of braces is how Postgres expresses empty array. Um, the, um, and then you need two things, which is a state a state function and a state type. Um, that is, every standard aggregate in Postgres um, is a pass-through function. It's a stream processing function in which data flows in and it gets added to a collector, which is whatever type you've expressed. In this case, what we're doing is we're just adding it onto the end of an array. And then when we're done adding it onto the end of the array, when we reach the end of the data, we're going to feed that entire array to our chi-square. Uh, PL function. The um, uh, do to do, do. So I already showed you this query, um, and this is actually gives you a better view of the query than what I had before, which was to then let's go ahead and look at all of the thefts within 50 meters, and that's the data we're going to feed into that chi-square function initially, um, and then the function actually gets very simple. So first, let's actually create the materialized view here. Do do do. There we go. So create our materialized view, rack theft, so materialized view. Yes. Um, the, um, and 
then we can go ahead and So let me do one other thing. Just so it doesn't display in scientific notation. Okay, I'd say it's pretty significant. Usually in stats, you're looking for a P of 05 or less, and this is a lot less. So at least on, on, an, on an idiot implementation of, the, of, of a chi-square test, um, if you're doing this for like real published data munging, you'd actually be a little more scientific about it. Um, we have data that at least is not a uniform is not a uniform distribution with minor random variations. Um, so now we've decided that it's significant. Okay, great. So we now know that there is some significance to some locations having more thefts than others. Okay, well that tells me that I should care, but how much should I care? Where you know I need to actually have okay. But I want to know, particularly this location that I'm going to park at, how safe or unsafe is it? So um, then I actually want to add some additional functions. Um, so this one here, um, I'm actually just going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check, you know, we've got an absolute number of thefts. But what I want to do is I want to say, in terms of our sort of population of thefts overall, how bad is this? So what I want to do is, one of the things that you have in stats, standard deviation says, you know, what is our sort of, if we assumed a normal distribution, how big is that curve? Um, and are we in the middle of the normal distribution with this one, or are we out on the wings somewhere? So I'm actually going to count how many standard deviations we are away from the mean um, for the particular data um, as our sort of expression of how risky is this bike parking location. Exactly. Um, and then I said I was going to mention windowing queries here. Because in order to compare the standard deviation, we have to take the standard deviation for the entire population and then compare it against the current stat. And the way that you do that inside the database is rather than making two runs at the database, which is what you would have to do if you were going back and forth from the outside, right? You'd have to get a total and then go back and get the detailed data, right? Or you'd have to read all the detailed data and then total them up on the client side, one way or the other. In this one, actually, we accumulate a total while we accumulate values, and then we compare them at the end. And that's up here, this with clause. Um, the with clause is called a common table expression. It's not very useful. I call them with clauses. Um, is a way to run a little sort of subquery that I'm going to feed up to the master query in one statement. And this little subquery um, gives me an aggregate here, and this little sort of mysterious clause here that says over in parentheses, this is what makes it a windowing clause. Now, if we actually had groups in here, like if we were doing this per city or something, then we would actually say something like over partition by city. But in this case, I don't have anything I want to divide by, so I just leave those parentheses empty. And so this actually gives me, let, let's get a total on the thefts, uh, an accumulation of the whole array of thefts, plus each individual theft, and then we're going to actually, or each individual theft location, and then we're going to actually compare them using our standard compare function. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So there we go. So we've got how many standard deviations are we away? So it's looking like leaving your bike anywhere near the Westfield Center is a really bad idea. And we've got 12 standard deviations away on the Westfield Center for their main bike rack. Plus, if you look at our number, what is it, number four, five, six, and seven placeholders, those are all businesses attached to the Westfield Center. So we've basically got, you know, I don't know, seven or eight bike racks around the Westfield Center, and every one of them is in our top 20 of places to steal a bike. Um, so, uh, that definitely tells me. Now, um, I actually wanted to dress this up a little bit more, so I actually, uh, created a table to actually give some, uh, text to that. So rather than, than having just numbers, I would have a little label, right? 
So if you're over like five standard deviations, then your bike has already been stolen. <laughs> you know, and then we go from very risky to just risky and kind of risky, and then our whole middle of the curve, and then we get into the, um, somewhere down here, we get into the kind of safe locations. Um, the, um, oddly enough, none of the locations in San Francisco came up as very safe, which would have really required no bike thefts. Um, every single bike rack location I actually had in the database had at least one theft near it. Um, that's San Francisco for you. So, all of that just an example of how you can benefit in data analysis by taking the same sort of SciPy analysis you would be doing outside the database and putting it in a function and doing it inside the database so it can be close to the data and so you can take advantage of some of the Postgres framework for managing and going through large sets of data um, in order to help SciPy out. So, do we have questions? Yeah, yeah. So I don't have data on how many people are parking their bikes. So I actually did adjust the figure by the size of the bike racks, how many, how many bikes the rack could hold, which is data I do have. So the, the actual, the final figures you saw there were divided by the number of, of ones that the rack could hold. The question was, you know, how do we know how many bikes are being parked there? Um, unfortunately, um, because they have no way to collect that data, um, except on the public rental bikes, which are electronic, but they have no way to collect that data on people's standard bikes. The city of San Francisco does not have data on how heavily used the bike racks are. So is there a reason to believe that, for example, the Westfield Center bike racks might be much more heavily used than the bike rack outside the Bernal Heights Pharmacy? Yes, probably. Um, the, um, uh, but is it, you know, is it 12 standard deviations more used, right, would be the other question. More questions? So you consider dropping the current data on top of the current data that you have on the top of the top of the top of the top of the top Yeah, so the question was, did I think consider, um, did I consider corresponding this against demographics? Um, and yeah, I thought about it, but I was trying to keep, keep the example relatively simple. Um, and um, the, um, and yeah, and you're right, that would affect things here. I mean, I would actually need to have an estimate of foot traffic because obviously very few people live at the Westfield Center, but a lot of people are there. Um, on the other hand, some of the, the, the numbers that I came up with here were a little surprising because at the Westfield Center, most people are parking their bikes during the day when there's a lot of people around. Those bike racks are in plain view um, of street traffic, and yet they're still obviously a heavy target for thefts. So like, if I was actually working with the police department at all, I would say, hey, how about having a foot patrol guy who just wanders around the Westfield Center looking for bike thieves? Evidence is he would catch some. Other questions? So in back first. Yeah. So the question was Amazon RDS having PL Python. So when they announced Postgres, they published a list of extensions that would be available. That list of extensions was inaccurate and included PL Python. Um, they basically came up with a list based on the popularity of the extension, and PL Python is one of our most popular extensions. Um, before they and the the list of ones they wanted was the one that was published, not the list of ones they had. Um, so they have the same problem that Heroku has, which is they have to prevent you as a user from breaking out of the PostgreSQL runtime, right? Um, and within PL Python, within 
Python, there's no way to do that. I can't, I can't prevent you from file system access, for example, inside um, a Python call. So there was another question further up here, and then we'll do that one in, in back over there. Were you the one further up here? Okay. So the question was, does this result in enormous performance improvements? Um, in my experience, yes, uh, particularly compared against running the SciPy on another machine. Um, the, it really varies by what you are able to do, like how much of the PostgreSQL machinery you're able to make use of. Like if you're able to make use of PostgreSQL doing things like windowing functions, et cetera, to avoid doing multiple calls to the database, then it's an enormous gain. If you're just going to do a once through of a moderate sized data set, um, then, and you're going to run the SciPy on the same server regardless, it won't be a huge gain. Right. Avoid it, yeah. Avoiding network traffic and doing less work is really the gain. Yeah. And so, um, not needing to not needing to grab the same data and reprocess it multiple times in the SciPy. So we had that question there was first. Ah, that's a good question. The question was, how do you determine what Python environment Postgres is actually using? Um, that actually is going to is going to get linked when you install. Um, well, which, which version of Python gets linked when you install PL Python? Um, so for example, um, one of the known issues is that you can't have um, PL Python 3 and PL Python 2 installed. You can't have Python 3 and Python 2 installed in the same Postgres database. You can actually have two databases in the same server using the different versions, but not in the same one. Um, in terms of using things like virtual ends, um, I've never done that. Um, I know that it's theoretically possible. Um, the um, but um, I would actually have to look up how to do that because um, you're usually running this on the server, so usually you install what's required for the application. But there can be environments where that's hard to do. Well, no, no, no. It needs to run as the Postgres super user, which is who is usually named Postgres. Um, yeah. So, so well, here's the so here's the issue. You need to be the Postgres super user to create or modify PL Python functions. If you do grants, because Postgres has its own security system then any user can execute those. So the issue is what you want to provide users in the way of their ability to create code. Um, the problem is that you can't, if you're hosting the multi-tenant system, you can't give them the ability to create whatever Peel Python function they want because then they can, for example, you know, just go ahead and do a write to postgresql.conf and change the configuration. Um, uh, so, um, the, um, and I don't really have a good answer for that that wouldn't involve a human being. Um, if we, if we had a good answer for that that didn't involve a human being clearing the code, then we would have actually created our own safe container and there would be a safe version of PL Python available. So, basically, your recommendation is actually Yo, actually, my recommendation on that, Docker. That's my recommendation. Um, well, the biggest, the one example I was showing you from the the portion of which is you know looking at the the nacelle direction, et cetera, um, that's um, a sh really large sharded power system database that's about six terabytes per shard. So something on the order of I don't know ten twenty billion rows 
um, of the main instrumental data in each shard. Um, the um, uh, so you know a lot of it depends on sort of what kind of data you're dealing with. Um, the um, and if I was to actually do an aggregation over 10 billion rows all at once, it would take a really long time. Um, in the case of that database, we do a lot of aggregation over Windows, and then we do aggregations of aggregations, and that works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, an aggregate written in, in Python is going to be slower than one written in C as a C function in Postgres. Um, if nothing else, just because of the call out to the library um, and the da extra data copying we have to do. You know, as in, you do get sort of special insight. You get access to Postgres's data without having to create a database connection within PLPython, but we still create a copy for the library to use. Whereas for C functions in Postgres, we don't have to create a copy. We can just give you a pointer to the data originally where it is. And on large data sets, creating that copy is actually a pretty significant amount of time. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'll, I will be talking tomorrow, actually, about graphs. So, as in picture graphs, not graph databases. The, um, could be either. Thanks. <laughs>